Good afternoon to you all. I hope you're all keeping well and staying safe. My name is Joyce O'Connor and I chair the digital group here at the IIE Way. Very warm welcome to you all to today's seminar on European digital sovereignty and the transatlantic relationship. This is a very timely webinar as the first council meeting of the transatlantic trade and technology um, Council took place yesterday. And we're particularly pleased to welcome our distinguished speaker, Frederick Ericsson. Frederick is the founding director of the European Centre for International Political Economy. A very warm welcome to you, uh, Frederick. In fact, it's a welcome back to the IIEA. I think it's about 10 years since we last saw you in person. Uh, but we're very pleased to welcome you today. You're very welcome and thank you for your time. Uh, that you've given us to be be with us today. This is the sixth event in the IIEA project entitled Europe's Digital Future, which is supported by Google. This project explores the topic of digital sovereignty in Europe, what the concept means and what it might hurl for the EU and for small economies like Ireland. Frederick will speak to us today for around 20 minutes and then we will go to questions and answers to your audience for your questions. The Q&A function, as you know, is at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to send in questions during the presentation. Today's presentation Q&A are both on the record and we would love if you would join us on Twitter using the handle at the IIEA. As I said, today's webinar is very timely. Yesterday, the US-EU Trade and Technology Council had its first meeting. Um, and there were, as we know, tensions on a range of issues. Frederick himself has commented that the inaugural meeting of the Trade and Technology Council is a constitutional moment where the EU and the US need to define what they can agree on. And I'm sure he will touch on that on it, uh, in his presentation. But we hear that the US and EU officials have pledged more coordination on tech and trade at the first council meeting, and that it did get off to a, a good start, taking into context the situation that prevails. In relation to digital sovereignty and transatlantic relationship, Frederick will argue that Europe's quest for digital sovereignty is unrealistic if it requires Europe to cut its dependence on the rest of the world by substituting foreign suppliers with local ones. Instead, Europe's relative economic decline means it will become more dependent on innovation and technological breakthroughs happening outside of the EU. In his view, Europe needs to deepen collaboration with the US and other like-minded countries to help shape the global norms and rules guiding digital markets. Frederick has helpfully categorized EU member states into digital managerialists, digital convergers, and digital front runners. You'd be glad to hear that Ireland is included in digital front runners, as is Netherlands, Denmark, Sweden, and Estonia, all members of our think tank network. Digital front runners are really important because they have a clearly articulated vision of where European policy should be aiming in the promotion of digitalization and also foster collaboration to try and influence the European policy agenda. Frederick is an uh, economist from Sweden, a distinguished writer and researcher. He's written on trade, regulatory policy, technological change and European relationships with North America and Asia. His latest book, which I think Frederick has a, a really fantastic title, that's The Innovation Illusion, How So Little Is Created by So Many Working So Hard, which I enjoyed very much. Uh, Frederick has advised several governments in Europe and worldwide. And the FT has ranked Fre Frederick as one of Brussels' 30 most influential people. Frederick, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Joyce. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. And also thank you to you and the, the rest of the team at the IIA for 
this opportunity to connect with you again and um, discuss um, matters of common interest and common concern. Um, I'm also glad you brought up a very old paper by me, sort of on categorizing European countries, uh, including Ireland, as a digital front runner. Um, and that um, um, we did ahead of uh, the establishment of the D9 group uh, between EU member states. Um, and I think the last time I was in Ireland, uh, which was a few years before the pandemic started, was actually um, at one of these D9 meetings and had the a great opportunity to also um, get a lot of uh, positive and constructive input from um, Irish officials, which are very good on, on these matters. So I'm what I'm going to do now is that I'm going to share my screen. I have a PowerPoint presentation and I'm going to uh, run you through a, a, a presentations with many different slides where, where I don't have time to spend so much. I don't have time to spend so much time talking about at each slide. So I'm going to set out my, my analysis and my arguments, and I'm going to end with a couple of uh, thoughts on the transatlantic relation, especially in light of what you just uh, mentioned, Joyce, the Pittsburgh summit uh, that ended yesterday uh, between the EU and United States and the establishment of the Transatlantic Trade and Technology Council. But I think sort of in order to both go into that issue and to go into sort of discussion around digital sovereignty in Europe, we also need to have uh, a much greater understanding about what type of economy that we're talking about, what type of consequences for the economy that various policy alternatives are going to have. So, so that's very much where I'm, I'm going to start um, my, my PowerPoint presentation today. All right, I think you should be able to see my, my screen now, right? All right, so, um, I mean, I think, I think we can sort of categorize two different approaches to digital sovereignty. And sort of there's one approach which I'm arguing against very strongly, which is that digital sovereignty should mean that we are reducing our dependence on other countries, on other countries' markets for the supply of technology, and, and digital services in Europe. Um, this would be sort of an independence-oriented policy that would include that we raise um, trade and investment barriers, that we would use regulations in a much more targeted way against foreign companies, that we would um, spend um, um, a lot more resources on industrial policy, um, et, et cetera. Um, my alternative view, which is going to uh, infuse my presentation here, as well as a paper uh, that I'm currently finishing for uh, the IAEA, um, uh, which hopefully is going to come out uh, uh, before long, is that my, my case would be that Europe should improve its autonomous capacity to understand, access, use, and develop new technologies and business models. And underlying that thought is that the problem isn't really uh, foreign innovation and competitiveness. Our problem is not that there are uh, brilliant minds in Asia, America, uh, Latin America, and Africa that are now generating new breakthrough technologies that we want to have. That is not our problem. Our problem is that we lack the, or at least we could approve our autonomous capabilities uh, to use, access, in the first place, understand, and develop a similar type of, of technologies uh, on our own. And in sort of line of that thinking, uh, my policy choice would, would uh, be to look much more at issues like human capital, uh, the innovations of firms, and capital markets. So, um, <clears throat> That's my, that's my overline thinking. So let's begin by talking a little bit about um, uh, the new type of economy and the new type of world that we are having. And me and my colleagues have framed this uh, in, in sort of the, uh, the framework of new globalization. As many of you would know, um, we've had a development um, over 
uh, more than 10 years right now where we have seen declining globalization when we look into uh, uh, the trade to trade in goods that volumes of trade in our goods sector didn't uh, uh, really manage to grow very far after the recovery from the global financial crises. As a consequence of that, we have seen um, uh, more regional, uh, even national sort of forms of the supply of goods compared to what we had before the financial crises. Um, but none of that means that globalization has uh, has petered out or that it's about to die, um, that we can sometimes hear from some commentators. It's just that globalization shaping is changing face and that we are moving from a globalization which has been crucially dependent on trade and goods uh, to uh, a, a globalization that is, is now uh, driven by ICT services and trade in ideas. And by trade in ideas, I basically mean trade in new technologies, new innovations, uh, uh, the sharing of knowledge, um, um, uh, the fact that our workplaces right now in the economy is organized in a way we, we almost have constant uh, collaboration with different, uh, different people in different parts of the world that are either supplying different inputs that we need or that are part of, of the actual uh, development that takes place inside an organization. What this chart is showing is an attempt to try to charge this particular development, but it's a bit difficult because trade in ideas is not a category that you're going to find in trade statistics. So what we what we are basically showing here is that since 2014, trade in ideas have been growing faster than than any other forms of trade. But this is only when only looking at uh, IP royalties. So uh, when we make a much more wider definition and try to understand how much more integration we have with the rest of the world right now in the way we work and in the way we transact. Uh, uh, the growth, of course, have been far stronger than that. If we look at some standard metrics on trade production and trying to figure out sort of the role that trade plays for, uh, for uh, our economy, we'll find that in manufacturing industries, we've been sort of on a declining path for, uh, for a pretty long time, meaning that trade in goods haven't really kept up with, uh, with uh, production. Um, so in terms of our dependency on, on, uh, on either exports or, or imports have actually gone down uh, over time. It looks very different if you look at uh, information industries, including both uh, telecom equipment producers and uh, telecom some telecom services where we have a trend going in in a different direction, which is that trade and economic integration is becoming an increasing part of of the total value of of our production. Europe is uh, is uh, generally speaking pretty well positioned for um, for this development, and this is some of the one of the issues which I have. Um, some problems with when it comes to European policymaking on, on digital services more generally is that we often take to start that discussion from the viewpoint that um, uh, we don't benefit from it or that other benefits more than we do. What I'm showing you here is, uh, is, is a comparative advantage analysis of the EU27 and United States when we use a very broad definition of digital services. We're not just looking into specific digital services like, for instance, uh, cloud services or search engines. Here we take a broader picture and we look at all services that have a high digital intensity um, where uh, digital forms of production and supply are, are crucial to the operation of the service overall. And then we're going to find sort of that Europe is actually in a very good possession, that we have a revealed comparative advantage that is significantly higher than in America. Um, and that's a reflection of the fact that Europe's economy is very global already and that we have uh, a vibrant services sectors that trade substantially with the rest of the world and generates a very significant um, uh, current account surplus in, 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 in these areas. 
So the point here is, is, is basically to say that um, the type of economy which is now growing, uh, um, the digital economy, the technology-based economy, is increasingly dependent on trade and integration with the rest of the world. We see a declining path for trade and integration in traditional goods, but, but sort of in the growing part of the economy, it's basically booming globalization right now. It's, it's, it's getting stronger uh, and moving, moving upward stronger um, uh, uh, much faster than, than most people would think. So, and this of course is, a, is an economy and it's a trade performance which reflects the broad underlying structural changes that we have in, in all our national economies where these economies are more dependent on, on new ideas, new innovations, new, um, um, new forms of producing and supplying uh, different, different products to, uh, to the economy. And this is where I would like to spend some time talking about uh, the development of the economy and where the concept of digital sovereignty basically sits, because here I think we have a problem uh, in Europe if we pursue the idea of going for uh, more sovereign supply uh, of, of um, digital innovations and, and digital services. Let's start by... Uh, by looking at this chart, which is uh, uh, known to you, it's More, Moore's Law, um, which is the doubling of chip capacity every second year. And we can see this, uh, uh, this trend line here, which has been enormously consistent uh, over many, many decades since the early 1970s, that we've had this fantastic development with uh, uh, doubling of the chip capacity every second year. Now, what is interesting here is not to, to, to just look at the output, but also trying to look at the input and trying to see what type of uh, 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 economic capacities are required in order to achieve uh, this, this magnific magnificent change over time. And then we're going to see um, uh, that there has been uh, uh, a huge change in the inputs required in order to achieve this particular outcome. So if we compare the early 1970s with the development in around 2015, we will find that in 2015, it required 18 times more researchers in order to generate that doubling of chip capacity every second year compared to um, um, the number of researchers that were needed in the early 1970s. And this has uh, led sort of uh, uh, to a greater understanding sort of of, of, uh, um, of the ideas-based economy, which is that, that this is something which is extraordinarily input dependent and input uh, uh, sensitive. Um, if we look at this chart, we're seeing uh, two different developments. One is um, looking at uh, the number of researchers, which is the right scale, you see the green line, and we can see from the 1930s uh, that the number of researchers are basically uh, now probably close to uh, 30 times uh, bigger than the number, the number of researchers that we had in the early 1930s. But then we look at the other, the other side, um, uh, the left scale, and we look at the blue line where we can see uh, dec decreasing research productivity, basically a measure on how good our research capacity is at generating new innovative technologies. And this is a trend which, as you see, have been going on for a very, very long time, which basically tells us one thing, which is that in order to generate the innovation outcome that we want for the economy, that to some extent we have grown accustomed to, we need to throw in more and more input resources for every year in order to achieve the same outcome. So I, for me, I mean, this is, this is an incredibly important starting point for understanding uh, 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 where the concept of digital sovereignty can take us. So if we look at Europe itself, we are a shrinking part of the global economy. Um, it's estimated that by 2050, the European Union is going to represent uh, less than 10% of global GDP. We're all in the now in a situation where 85% of all growth happens outside of the EU. And what this basically means is that 
more and more new ideas, more and more brilliant people that generate new ideas will be based outside of Europe. Uh, the, the less significant uh, that Europe is uh, in the total global economy, the more we are going to get dependent on the supply of new technologies and new ideas from outside of the EU. Um, this is a natural reflection of the fact that the world and the world economy has equalized remarkably over the past 40 years, and that we are now in a situation where already now uh, a growing part of new innovations are coming from uh, other parts of the world than the Atlantic region. Our own demography isn't uh, exactly going in uh, a direction which is helpful uh, here because uh, we have a general demographic development, um, which leads to, in some countries, a nominally shrinking population. Uh, more generally, for many of the countries, we are having a development where uh, the relative share of the working population in relation to total population is, is going down. Um, so uh, we are confronted with the development of either nominally or relatively shrinking labor forces, which means that cost and shortages of staff is going to go up. We already now in a situation where there's a global undersupply of human capital, especially of, of talented human capital that is required in areas like uh, IT engineering, uh, AI, etc. There is an ever stronger competition uh, for getting access to these talents, which makes situation much more difficult uh, for Europe when it comes to attracting uh, talents from the rest of the world to come to Europe when we are facing uh, supply constraints uh, uh, domestically because of a shift in demography. And this is, in my view, sort of a, a part of a broader trend where we're moving from a la labor shock type of economy uh, highly dominated by, by the rise of China and other emerging markets which, which supply the economy with a lot more labor. And now we're entering a phase which is probably going to be more like a labor shortage type of economy, where most economies in the world are going to be competing to attract um, uh, talented labor. So coming back here then to my initial point, in this context, I don't think it's possible to uh, have a policy which is going to lead to the pursuit of digital sovereignty for the simple reason that we don't have enough autonomous capacities to substitute uh, what we would get from foreign suppliers of technology in the future. We already have supplier problems right now, and given our own sort of relative economic decline and given our demographic situation, we will be faced with more constraints in the future of supplying uh, the type of inputs we need in order to generate uh, uh, the economy uh, we want to have and that would make us competitive. So again, our sovereignty problem isn't for innovation and competitiveness. It's our lacking autonomous capabilities, especially human capital and capital, which leads to different absorption gaps when it comes to Europe's economy's ability to actually adjust to new technologies. So this is where I'm going to end my presentation, spend some time thinking about these issues. Um, and my, my policies are, so my policy preferences are that we should spend a lot more resources and energy talking about how we can improve higher education, um, especially to make sure that we can supply our economy with more computer engineers, AI engineers, and of course, other type of human capital is needed. We have too little research spending in Europe. We have no world-class university in the EU. Uh, we need to find ways to build up uh, a lot more uh, top-notch uh, capabilities in Europe, not, not just to supply uh, the economy more generally with human capital, but also uh, be able to supply with, with world-class human capital and with, with sort of environments uh, of knowledge that generates um, uh, new technology and new ideas. And lastly, we have too few uh, EU countries that have financial markets that are deep enough in order to fund entrepreneurial projects and fund the type of, of firms that are going to grow as a consequence of that. And both these problems are most likely going to be exacerbated in the future. Here is a chart which comes from uh, the German Business Association for IT Companies, Bitcom. Uh, 
uh, and it shows Germany's gap of AI engineers. Um, in 2019, there were 100, 124,000 uh, AI engineers which weren't supplied uh, when they looked at static metrics, metrics of uh, what was demanded and what the supply was. Uh, they also, uh, in, the, in their study, uh, looked at the substitution rate for an AI engineer. So from the point that a company uh, starts to look for an AI engineer, uh, it now takes around nine months in order, in, in order to find one uh, that is free and available to go into, uh, to work in their, in their organization. If we look at our population uh, pyramid, we will see how here sort of that our uh, our pyramid is is getting squeezed in the middle, meaning that the working age population in relation to uh, uh, to elderly is 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 getting smaller and smaller. Uh, this is for the EU as a whole. Some of these problems are more acute for some countries, countries like Italy, Germany, for instance. Other countries have have sort of smaller challenges on this front, but broadly speaking, we have, uh, uh, we are facing sort of development over the next 80 years, which is going to lead to uh, exacerbated problems with, with, with labels, labor supply. Now, um, let's look a little bit at finance and uh, the capital markets uh, and the ability of, um, of the market to fund uh, the type of new entrepreneurial um, digital companies that we want to see. This is a chart showing you uh, the share of GDP um, that goes into different stages of funding, seed funding, startup funding, later stage funding, and total. And as you can see here, uh, these are not nominal swallows, these are share of GDPs. Uh, uh, European countries trail America with a very, very good distance. To dig deeper into that particular issues and look at where venture capital comes from, um, uh, looking at the type of funding, we can see that uh, Europe has, has uh, two uh, 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 very big uh, uh, problems compared to America, which is that uh, the supply that comes from capital markets, um, you can see this at the lower end of this bar chart, is, is much lower in America compared to in, in Europe, and we can see that the funds that comes from pension funds is also much lower here than it is in America, which of course reflects uh, a development where an increasing part of, of, of pensions are tied into different type of funds that have difficulties participating in, in the funding of entrepreneurial projects. Um, and I think this is, is, is a challenge that basically the entirety of Europe is confronted with that we have problems turning uh, savings into uh, entrepreneurial funding. Um, and this is something which we really need to work on in order to improve our autonomous capabilities. Now, looking at then consumer uh, at, at absorption gaps more generally, this is a chart we're showing you three different lines. Uh, the blue line is the OECD technological frontier. Uh, the orange line is the EU technology frontier. And the gray line is the frontier of a leading EU economy called Germany. Um, and this is based on basically, you take a couple of indicators of where the technological frontier, air, the frontier is, in this case, consumer oriented type of, of indicators. And then you try to position different countries to that frontier and understand sort of how fast the absorption process has been. And as we can see here, uh, there isn't much of a difference between the OECD and the EU frontier, and there isn't much of a distance between where Germany and, and uh, 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 advanced economies are more generally. But this is for consumers. If we look at businesses and we look at the absorption of digital technologies for businesses, we see a different development. Again, the blue line is the OECD frontier, the orange line is the EU frontier, and the gray line is Germany where we can see that the absorption of technologies and the gap between where Germany is uh, in relation to the OECD frontier or where the EU frontier is compared to the OECD frontier is bigger and bigger. Uh, this is something which is expanding over time, meaning that the growth or absorptions of new technology in the European economy moves slower 
than it does in other types of economy, meaning that Europe is getting increasingly distant from the frontier uh, over time. So uh, let me end on a few final notes on the transatlantic relations. And I'm not going to spend that much time uh, on this issue, uh, partly because um, uh, uh, we sort of had sort of the Pittsburgh results coming out overnight. Um, need to chew on that a little bit more before coming to sort of any conclusions around it. So I'm, what I'm going to do uh, here is basically setting a couple of frameworks for that particular conversation, how Europe should think about its transatlantic relations. An independent strategy is effectively means that we're going to cut the dependence on America. That's what an independent strategy means more generally, because right now we do uh, rely on American uh, technology to uh, a substantial degree. However, um, that reliance itself needs to be put in, in, um, in perspective. Um, if we look, for instance, at core digital services, like the ones I mentioned before, uh, for instance, cloud services. There aren't that many core um, digital services, but when we look at them, we'll find that Europe's trade deficit with America isn't very substantial at all. If we look at the three uh, core categories of digital services, we'll find that Europe's trade deficit with America equals 1.8 billion uh, US dollars. That's, that's the amount we're talking about here. When we expand the concept to include uh, services and sectors that are digitally intensive, we of course going to come to a conclusion that Europe most likely have a trade surplus with America on digitally intensive or digitally enabled uh, output simply because uh, Europe has a substantial trade surplus with America more generally, it amounts to uh, almost 140 uh, billion US dollars per year. Um, but if we pursue then, uh, if we look at technology and the supply of technology, not sort of trade statistics, statistics I mean, cutting the dependence on the EU, given the contextual points I've already given you on where the economy is going and supply constraints in the European economy, that means we're going to grow the dependence on someone else. Uh, the alternative is basically that we're going to reduce access to frontier technology for European uh, companies and for European consumers. And I don't think that would be a very good choice because that's going to have a knock-on effect on productivity and economic output. So, so th that raises the point. So if, if we want to cut the dependence on the United States, so who do we want to grow our, our dependence on? Because cutting the dependence on the United States doesn't mean uh, uh, by any degree of, of automaticity that we're going to increase our independence are on own sources for supply of technology. It's most likely means that we're going to grow the dependence on someone else. And the question is, who, who is that someone else that we want to grow the dependence on? I'd also be careful with that particular policy uh, on that sort of old dictum that source for the goose is source for the gander, um, which means that if Europe is going to cut its dependence uh, on United States for the supply of technology, then United States is going to cut its dependence on the EU for the supply of, of technology. And that is also going to include digital or AI sectors where Europe tend to be strong. Um, for instance, uh, digitally enabled services, robotics, industrial AI, etc. So if, if, we, if we make a deliberate move in order to reduce our, our dependence on technology from America, America is going to do the same to us, and that's going to basically means that there will be lower output for, uh, for the companies uh, that are now uh, being able to supply America with these type of goods. I would rather hope that we are going to uh, move forward in the transatlantic relationships on the basis of a constructive engagement, and I would look very much, if I look at this from a European point of view, on what I would call areas of brilliance, basically areas where Europe need to increase its performance, and that's going to be in top R&D, in universities, and in venture capital capabilities. 
The other part uh, I would go a lot for is on the rules and norms for free and fair competition in the digital economy. Here, looking at what Europe and America can do together in order to shape the standards for the global economy in the future. This is very much part of the conversation of the uh, Transatlantic Trade and Technology Council. The working groups that now have been established are uh, quite often connected to exactly these issues. Um, they have been designed not so much to deal with bilateral frictions between United States and America, even if, of course, they are included in, in, in there. Uh, you can clearly see that this is an attempt um, uh, by Europe and America to avoid sort of the strong forces of relative economic decline that both sides are confronted with and see if stronger collaboration between them uh, can arrest this development of shrinking influence for both uh, Europe and America on, on the design of, of the global economy here. Um, my take on, on the Pittsburgh summit is that I think this has been uh, a good moment to start this. I think uh, what came out from it was quite okay. Um, I think they managed to uh, uh, do what was required to do uh, in order to uh, sort of at least give uh, uh, indications that they are prepared to invest in a trustful relation between each other. Um, I think now comes the hard work and the work that we need to see what's going to happen in future to make sort of a judgment whether this is an exercise which is going to be consequential or not. And that, of course, is going to uh, be critically, it's critically going to depend upon the interest on both sides uh, to let this collaboration uh, be influential in the type of regulations they are going to shape domestically for uh, uh, digital technologies, for digital services, and for a host of other new technologies in the future. And there I'm not so sure. Um, I think my my expectation would be that um, sort of the convergence that we have seen transatlantically over the years will continue. Um, and in order to break that trend and move towards more convergence, I think there will have to be a lot more political capital invested in this in order to make sure that it means something for both sides when they are uh, in their own processes of trying to come up with the regulations and the policy choices uh, that are going to define how they approach new technologies in the future. So we'll see. Um, but I'm going to stop there. So thanks, thanks for the time so far, Joyce. Thank you so much, uh, Frederick. That was an excellent presentation and a very stimulating analysis and observations about where we are now and putting it in the context of this new globalization. I think that's a, a very compelling concept um, and offers a lot of positives, it, particularly when you talk about the, the cost and power of new ideas. And, you know, as you've said, that means there needs to be much more investment in research and development in universities and an understanding of where that comes from. So it strikes me um, that all that you talked about in contributing to the debate about digital sovereignty is to look at, you know, in many ways it's an abstract concept, but when you peel away the parts, there's very, very concrete things we can do to develop Europe at each member state by, as you very clearly say, through collaboration, through understanding of what's going on, and through making very positive decisions in that area. And I just wonder, um, Frederick, just to start off, there's an, quite a lot of questions coming in, but if I might take the first one, uh, if the cost of new ideas for breakthrough innovation is going up, how, how can Europe respond to this? Should there be greater public investment? I think you'd say there would, and support for research. And when you look at the, you know, the digital agenda the, that, and the discussion with Ursula von der Leyen, you know, early in January, February last year, there was a really positive outflow of, we can do this, we can move forward. 
Um, but is the investment there in Europe and is the investment, you know, in member states adequate? Oh, I think I think the answer to that is an obvious no. Mm. Uh, I mean, if you look at the trend line, corporate investment uh, in R&D as share of either output uh, or as share of GDP is going down. Mm. If you look at public investment into R&D, the trend line is the same as a share of the GDP, it's going down. Uh, I applaud um, um, what Ursula von der Leyen has been saying, but in this case, I mean, she is more sort of the chief cheerleader for Europe than she is sort of the chief executive officer who can actually manage to get this to change. Mm. Um, what worries me is that um, sort of the political compact that's arising in Europe right now, as we saw, for instance, in the negotiation over the new budget uh, with the next generation EU facility, we're actually reducing uh, the amount we spend on R&D in the EU budget as well. Um, mm. And that worries me. Um, and uh, it worries me that so few policymakers are understanding the seriousness and the sort of uh, the problems that we are confronted with that uh, we have a general problem with supply of human capital to the economy mm -hmm. and we have a problem that we don't have the top university and knowledge environments in Europe. I mean, I'll, I'll, so the last time I look at the university ranking, I think the, the first European university that came on top of it was a German university. And I think it came on place number 27 or 28th. Mm. Um, we have a lot of American uh, universities, a few UK universities yeah. at the top there. But we also find that universities from other parts of the world, especially China, is, is yeah. improving, improving themselves very fast. And of course, that yeah. is a combination of, of the ability to put money uh, from governments yeah. and corporations into this, understanding sort of the necessity for R&D in the 21st century. Mm. But it is, as you say, uh, an understanding. Is there a lack of understanding? And how, how can we get at a European level, but also at member state level, policymakers to respond to this. And we, we've we got our budget coming up, you know, fairly soon, uh, you know, and in discussions, you know, higher educational institutions, research and development isn't at the top of the list at all because there, there's so many other priorities. But how do you get, how do you get the real understanding of, the, the issues that you've raised across in a policy context? That's, that's a very good question, Joyce. Uh, I don't think I have a good answer. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's one of those issues where the consequences of underperforming levels of investment and, um, and output, they show over time. They don't, they're not going yeah. to be visible in a short, short period of time. Um, um, so, it, it's, a, it's a slow moving development in that sense, which means that perhaps policymakers aren't um, uh, incentivized to respond to them uh, very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And of course, given all the pressures that are on governments right now with, with on the fiscal side, um, it's easy to, uh, to, ignore. to ignore or sort of prioritize <laughs> other things to spend on instead. But I think, I mean, one thing which I think was pretty optimistic is that there was a business round table in Pittsburgh yesterday mm. and and um, the president of the uh, business federation digital europe uh, was asked there so if if there's one thing you can mention as the top priority for uh, for what what needs to happen transatlantically um, she said well it's not going to be anything around you know norms and policies for the future mm. of global economy it's skills it's digital skills yes, that's it's yeah. okay. investing in, in human capital that's yeah. the one issue and i think we need to hear sort of a lot more for from businesses too on these issues that yeah this is a bottleneck right now and it is and in a lot of the areas as you've shown in ai and other emerging technologies there's 
shortages, you know, in every member state, Europe, and in fact, as you say, the world. Um, but it's and just to finish maybe on this, the you know what I find interesting, the concept of talent, discussion around talent and around skills is seen perhaps not at the level you're discussing it at. It's immediate, long-term planning, workplace planning for growth probably doesn't exist because there's been an assumption that, you know, we'd be all right on the day. But in fact, that's now become a real planning, isn't it? That forecasting for the future and building a pipeline, both in European and member states, and looking, looking to, in many ways, underpin the development of our society. It's come back to the human talent now, uh, rather than other issues, as you say. Absolutely. No, it's, that's exactly the development we have. There's a question here now that may go to our audience, and thank you for sending it in. It's Paul Oduber, and he says it's change, it's change the topic. What about the situation where the US exercised its foreign policy by restricting certain countries' access to its technology, including indirect access via EU? Can Europe break out of this? Yeah, no, indeed. Um... I mean, this this sort of um, I think comes back to conversation that we had uh, previously, Joyce, which is that when we look at um, sort of specific areas where there are strategic vulnerabilities for Europe, uh, we'll find sort of that um, there are around between sort of fifty to sixty goods, uh, including technologies, uh, where we have some of these for vulnerabilities. Most of them are going to relate to raw material supply, uh, predominantly from uh, from China, but not exclusively from China. There are a few other countries as well. Um, there will be some problems related to um, uh, imports we have right now, where we're highly dependent on, on the Gulf or Turkey. And then there will be a few technology issues where we are dependent on, on the United States. And, and if and when the US decides to uh, uh, basically stop the export of these of these technologies to Europe. Uh, there will be uh, knock-on effects on on the ability of Europe to um, uh, to use that technology for productive purposes. And I, I think sort of it's it's this is an area where which is obviously on the agenda uh, in 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 the Transatlantic Trade and Technology Council. I think this is also probably an area where uh, where they will be able to. Uh, find some common ground in order to avoid these situations. Um, but non none of that sort of takes away um, the necessity for Europe to think about its own autonomous capabilities here, uh, mm -hmm. which of course includes how, how do we make, how do we improve our own capacity to be competitive in these technologies so that we don't have these strategic vulnerabilities. We're not going to be less uh, vulnerable by cutting particular supply or using sort of border measures in order to deal with it. It's, it's mostly about how do we create the environment necessary at home in order to make sure that we are going to have in all these sectors, European firms that are going to be part of the frontier development. They're not going to dominate it, but they're going to be part of the frontier development and make sure that at least we have sort of a full understanding uh, of what is going on. We have enough IP in the area to make sure that, well, if if you know if if shit hits the fan, we it's going to be possible to find some diverse diversification solutions to it. But but again, we are coming back to autonomous capabilities. None of that is going to happen uh, just because we say we have a vulnerability. It's crucially comes down to our ability to foster that development internally. Yes, and and you know, in the, in that area, you know, Seamus Allen, a researcher here at the IA, asked the question: How divided are the EU member states when it comes to these policies? You know, do we speak with one voice in a way? No, I think there is a significant uh, degree of divergence internally in Europe. Um, um, and it's not just sort of on technology issues with relation to America, it's technology issues with relation to Turkey, with relation to, uh, to China. Um, uh, overall, however, I would say 
there is a growing convergence in Europe in understanding these issues and the importance of that we deal with them. But when it comes to policy choices for how to deal with them, I'm not seeing sort of enough convergence yet. Purchase of that. And you mentioned that you, <clears throat> you spoke, was it before the D9 group was set up here a, a few years ago? How do you access, assess, if you like, the work of the D9 group of countries influencing EU policy? And they're pre you would have seen those as front runners, really, digital front runners. Oh, absolutely. No, I mean, I think they are, uh, they are really punching below their weight um, in terms of, of, of policies. Um, um, and I think they're punching below their weight, not just in areas of digital policy. I think this applies sort of to many other issues in, in, in Europe where there has been sort of a shift in recent years where, um, where new policy proposals are coming up um reflect more the sort of the concerns that are specific to large economies than concerns that smaller, smaller countries and and yeah. general for the eu um but i mean sort of the good news is that i mean if you look at any type of indicator on on digital performance uh, it's the same type of countries that perform well yeah. which means that um i mean sort of if you if you have a discussion around europe about choices where they want to go there are not there are at least very few people who are going to point to germany and say look whatever they're doing we want to do the same in terms of the digital penetration or digital performance yeah. they're not looking at france and say you know my god they have really you know made it here and what can yeah. we do the same I, I don't hear anyone saying that I, but i hear sort of a lot of people pointing to other economies to try to understand what is it that they have done which have worked well and that we can learn from um, and and these these economies are going to be very much the D9 economies. Yeah. Um, related to that, I think we are also downplaying the significance of um, of Central and Eastern European economies here um, on sort of various type of um, digital readiness indicators on you know mm. the telecom network, uh, broadband penetration. They they are not at the same level as as sort of the front runners in Europe. But what they have done is they have gone through a process of strong structural economic change in the economy, which led to the decline of many legacy firms. And mm. in their place, they have seen the growth of many new firms and growth, especially of firms that are pretty skilled at using digital technologies to serve um, companies in other countries with, with different type of digital services. And they're pretty good at it, which means that given the sort of inputs they have in the economy, the investments they have made, uh, they're getting a lot of output for it. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's an, another, another mix to, to bring into the discussion yeah. well, is that we, we won't, you know, we need to understand the relationship between input and output, but, but we also want to have an effective use of it. So whatever we are investing in, in, into digital capacities, we want it to generate more growth as well. And, and these economies have been very good at that. Yeah. And then, you know, you, you've said about other countries and given the, the common values and democratic system, you, you, the, the question of working with democracies like South Korea, Japan, India, and Taiwan to, to create a rebalance in our dependencies is very attractive. Why is it that we're slow to move outside that ambit of the US and so on. Do you, you know, why, why do we do that? So, I mean, I mean, I think there is, there is much work that goes on, um, which are not reaching sort of the newspaper headlines. I mean, this is work in the OECD, it's working different working groups that have been established that includes sort of Western, countries plus um, liberal democracies in other parts of the world that have an interest in this particular development. And, and a, lot of that, a lot of that is, is going on. Um, I think sort of one of the problems is that, and this is not just Europe, it's also other countries that are trying to figure out, so what's the political model? What's our own framework for these issues going to be in the future? Mm. To what extent do we need to 
sort of move into a new type of globalization where we increase our dependence on other parts of the world in the same time as they increase their dependence on us. Mm. Um, and lacking sort of the confidence and the trust uh, that we had 20 years ago that this was a model which was going to generate net benefits to all of the participating economies. I think we're now sort of stuck in, in, in trying to find, so what are the alternative mechanisms going to look like? Can we make them important, consequential, or is it just going to be sort of detailed work going on uh, uh, in the back rooms and on the ground, but it's not really changing any any way that we think about how to deal with these issues. Um, hmm. So in that sense, I think if we place the Transatlantic Trade and Technology Council into that context, I think I think it can be important. It can sort of invest more confidence and trust into the notion that, well, you know what, we we actually on on technology issues. As in every other issues, we share the world with 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 many others, and we need to figure out solutions that are actually going to work for all of us in the future. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll see. I mean, if if we can take sort of a few steps in that direction with uh, with the TTCC, I mean, I think that would be would be a positive development. And you you know, what do you think in that that might be the other priorities working through the through the through that framework? Um, you mean in digital or more generally in the world? Well, in digital and, and more general, probably, because the two are interrelated, probably. Um, yeah, no, indeed. I mean, I'll, I'll, I mean, sort of, I think the first, the first thing which is important is that if, if this development stops at the borders of Europe and America, um, then we are missing an opportunity to, uh, uh, to do something more. This is not to say that the membership of, of uh, the TTTC is going to increase now, but I think it's, it's, it's a point which is that we need to think about measures to internationalize whatever is going to come out of these discussions and anchor them in, in forms of collaboration which is going to be useful for the future to include many other countries. Um, mm. I, I have always thought sort of that we are grossly underestimating the usefulness of the OECD uh, as, yeah. as a sort of a platform to have good and constructive discussions about how we move forward uh, in countries that share similar type of economic uh, structures and have, have similar type of political beliefs. Um, so I would say uh, I would sort of invest a lot more into, into sort of increasing the usefulness of the OECD as, as a mechanism in order to negotiate and establish uh, uh, new forms of, of norms, perhaps even agreements that are going to guide us uh, in, in the future on these issues. Uh, but I think none of this is going to happen. And from a European perspective, Europe's role in all that is going to be diminished if if we also sort of continue this development of trying to hide ourselves from the rest of the world, um, we need to have sort of a lot more constructive engagement with other parts of the world to demonstrate that we're not just there in order to preach or to uh, sort of pursue various type of mercantilistic interests we have. We come with a broader idea for how we can establish institutions and norms that will be helpful for other yeah. things in the future as well. And that's going to include peace, climate change, um, uh, and a host of other different issues. And now, I mean, given the development with AUKUS and what happens in the Indo-Pacific, uh, this is what I would like to see Europe go. A lot more political investment into that particular region. It's the commercial pulse of the future. It's where a lot of the technology will arise in the future. And we have something to bring to that region, which is different type of capacities, different type of powers, and we should use them. But now we are, uh, we are almost hiding from that part of the world. We, 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 think, we think we can sort of, you know, if, if the development in the Indo-Pacific is, is going to be sort of the big story of the 21st century, I often get the feeling that Europe thinks they can sit this one out and see what's going to come afterwards. Well, Frederick, unfortunately, time is, is, has come up on us and thank you so much. We could go on talking about it. I, I think you've given us a great perspective on uh, not only digital sovereignty, but going looking to the world with this new globalization. What are the implications for us? 
but perhaps more importantly, that we have the power ourselves to change the agenda, to look and work collaboratively. And, and that really, I think, is a is very positive note to end on. Um, we look forward to receiving your paper, um, which will be, be published before Christmas. So, so thank you so much for your contribution today and the generation of new ideas, new models, and the emphasis on the cost of ideas. That, that's what, in a sense, you can see the IIAA about, is about, it's sharing ideas uh, and shaping policy. And on your behalf, my behalf, I'd like to thank the audience for their for participation, for your questions. We look forward to seeing you uh, soon again. And to our production team, um, Lorcan um, and Sarah, thank you for all your work. And I'd like to mention our network of think tanks who've been with us today uh, at our earlier meeting with Frederick, Adrian Venables, Andrew, Gilmore, Bridget Decker, and Katrina Sorison and Seamus Allen. So thank you for all, all the discussion we had today. It's been a stimulating morning, Frederick. Thank you very much. We look forward to welcoming you back and hopefully in, in, in person in the future. So goodbye to everybody and thank you very much and look forward to seeing you in the future and stay well and keep safe. Goodbye now and thank you again.